Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, adventurers, travelers, investors, entrepreneurs, and simply mind bogglers. To find all episodes of this show, simply go to Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube, or go to our website, judgmentcallpodcast.com. If you like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or subscribe to us on YouTube. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the airfare deals that you really want. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% in the airfare. Those include $150 round-trip tickets to Hawaii for many cities in the US, or $600 life led tickets in business class from the US to Asia, or $100 business class life led tickets from Africa round trip all the way to Asia. In case you didn't know, about half the world is open for business again and accepts travelers. Most of those countries are in South America, Africa and Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP or if that's too many letters for you, simply go to MTP, the number four, and the letter u.com to sign up for your 30 day free trial. Um, I, I actually, I actually just wrote a, uh, um, <laughs> a novella on these topics, which, uh, I, I have, I'm, I, I've just begun looking for, a, for a publisher for, but it's, it's very, very of this moment and about those last topics that you were raising. Um, uh, I can, I can send it to you if you'd like. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Well, I'd love to talk about it then. So I think that's a really good match. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the, what is the core of the, the, the novel? Well, uh, it, it's 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 short. It's it's about an eighty-page uh, kind of novella, and mm -hmm. um, it um, it's it's quite it's quite uh, um, dense and it's a bit unconventional. But but basically, um, it uses the. I mean, I'm not a singularity person, uh, to be clear. I, I you know I, I'm a little bit. Um, uh, it's, I, well, more than a little bit skeptical of, of a lot of the kind of Kurzweil, you know, singularity sorts of. But, of but Ray works for your employer now, right? Oh yeah, he's a colleague. Um, and uh, and he knows he knows about my skepticism, but um, but at the same time, I think he also ha he also has a couple of a couple of very valid points. Uh, you know, one being that you know history is clearly exponentially speeding up. I mean, that's that's obvious. Um, and um, and also that uh, you know I, I I'm not I, I think that brain uploading and so on is actually quite a long way off if if that will ever work. But we are certainly you know approaching a moment when uh, artificial intelligence is. Uh, you know, start starts to need to be taken very seriously, not just not just as as machine learning models, but you know, as as real intelligences. And I, th I think things like GPT three are a bit of a wake up call in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so yeah, the structure the structure of the novella, it you know, it's very heady. It uses uh, Walter Benjamin and his theses on the philosophy of history as a okay. uh, as a sort of a frame, and and it. Um, uh, and it's it sort of imagines that the moment that we're going through right now is sort of like an event horizon. Um, and uh, uh, and yes. it has three sorts of chapters that are broken up into sort of the, the present, before times, and after times. Uh, the before times chapters are are in the form of of documents uh, or fragments that that uh, that come from the past and that are um, uh, actually used as part of the training of the uh, of the of the ML. Um, yeah. The the current you know the, the the sort of present tense parts are are a narrative that takes place over about nine days and it's not nothing nothing earth shaking happens in that narrative it, it's during COVID times it's it's almost autobiographical and it, and it's kind of very compressed so nothing you know it, it's it, it's not not a lot happens but you see sort of the development of the AI and then the yeah. after times is written in terms of iteration numbers and uh, and is uh, and is is written from the point of view of the of the AI. And there's sort of mysteries about, you know, who, like, who is, who is actually writing this thing? Who is the reader? Who is the writer? You know, what, what's the perspective from which it's being written? So it's a little bit of a meta, a meta novella, kind of like, uh, like Nabokov's uh, Pale Fire or something like that, where there's you know, an un unreliable okay. narrator and you're, un you're unsure until yeah. near the end, you know, what's going on. It sounds like great science fiction. I, Thank I you. Read that. <laughs> it sounds awesome. It is a, and um, I had a lot of fun. A lot of fun writing it. I wrote it between my first and second COVID shots, kind of a little, in a little bit of a fever <laughs> dream. But yeah, that sounds really interesting. Hey, so just just before I get it wrong all the time, how do I sure. pronounce your name correctly? 
Uh, Blaise. So uh, Blaise. first name oh, yeah. Blaise. Uh, I mean, the French way is Blaise, but nobody says that. Um, yeah. And uh, the last name is Aguera y Arcas, but just Blaise is good. Okay. Okay. I might be able to do this. Um, <laughs> so you, you spent about two decades now, as far as I know, um, working first at Microsoft and now at Google at teams that are really at the core there, from what I understand, at the, the bleeding edge of technology. And they are both technology companies, but you've chosen a job to really head the bleeding edge teams for, and I think now it is AI, before it was more maps and more, more other topics. Why did this job choose you? How did you get into that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'm, I'm very, I've been very, very lucky, very privileged to be, you know, sort of in these very exciting times and places. Uh, and um, it's a little bit of a long story. My, my, um, my training, um, such as it is, is actually in, in physics and computational neuroscience. And um, uh, my, my wife is a computational neuroscientist. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we wrote a couple of papers, you know, together back in the day. Um, and... Um, you know, in, in a sense, I, I, I feel like the dawn of the computing age was very much interwoven with uh, with the dawn of computational neuroscience. Of, of uh, you know, so, so this idea that computers are are artificial brains it's not a new thing. That was that was that was a, a kind of core part of the entire concept of computing from the beginning. Um, you know, the the uh, even to the point where um, things like uh, the the logic gate symbols. Uh, I, I think I talked about this in, in one of the in one of the TED talks. The logic gate symbols are actually uh, derived from the symbols for pyramidal neurons uh, in uh, in one of the key uh, McCulloch and Pitts papers from the 1940s that that sort of draws an analog between between computing elements and and, and neurons. And, and so that was very much present in the minds of Turing and von Neumann and the other kind of early computing pioneers. So um, you know, I've I've always had a feeling that that you know. Although these are kind of twins separated at birth that are going to reconverge, uh, and have been sort of biding my time, you know, <laughs> until they reconverge and working on other other problems in the meanwhile. Um, so, you know, the, the problems that that I was working on and the teams that I was leading at Microsoft had uh, had more to do with uh, classical computer vision uh, and machine vision. Uh, you know, there are there are certainly some parallels between the teams that I led there and the teams that I'm, I'm leading at Google. Um, I was there for about seven years. I'm, 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 I've been at Google now for about seven years as well. It's a bit less than 20 years, but I had a startup before that, which Microsoft acquired. And um, classical computer vision is not very brain-like. Uh, you know, so so uh, um, the, the first TED talk was about was about Sea Dragon and photosynth. Photosynth is is a, is a classical uh, computer vision problem. But what began um, happening toward the end of the time of my time at Microsoft, two things changed. Uh, one was about the company, and one was about the the technological milieu. On the company side, um, I, you know, I certainly don't want to say anything negative about Microsoft. They were they were they were wonderful to me. I grew a tremendous amount at that company, but uh, the company made a decision, um, partly based on their failure to break into the phone market, uh, the the sort of failure of Windows phones. I think made it clear that that it was destined to turn back to its roots and become more of a B2B sort of company. Um, and that's a, that's a move that Satya Nadella has executed very effectively, uh, which you know, has made the stock price go up quite a bit. And so you know, it's been good for the company, but it made it less the kind of company that I wanted to, to, um, to work at. Uh, you know, for me, uh, the, the most exciting problems and, and the greatest innovations are, are, are very much in, in um, I, I hate to say consumer, but uh, you know, in, in things that affect people as opposed to companies, I, I suppose. Um, so it's become a little bit more of an IBM style company, you know, since since I left, and I saw that change coming, and 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 that yeah. that made me think about about a change, but um, you know, for myself as well. But the other thing was um, this was in 2013. Uh, it had become clear by 2013 that neural nets were back, uh, like really back with a vengeance. Um, you know that that was. Um, this was after some of the really groundbreaking new uh, um, uh, results from convolutional neural nets that showed that that uh, computer vision problems that had that had been intractable for decades, uh, you know, being able to recognize what kinds of objects are in a visual scene, for example, were finally getting solved, 
and solved in a, in a, in a fairly brain-like way. I mean, I, I don't want to overstate the analog between convolutional nets and visual cortex, but you know, it is, it is a, a, a visual cortex-inspired architecture, and it's certainly not a conventional computing sort of approach. There's not a program being run. It is you know, virtual neurons being activated you know, in, in, in cascades. And, um, and it seemed to me that, uh, and, and to a lot of people, I think at that time, that, that you know, the, what, what we were calling deep learning at the time was really rising. And I felt that this was going to change everything. So uh, Google was the, was the place, you know, that was the company that was really at the forefront and still is uh, of, that, of that kind of work. And that made Google very appealing. Um, but there was also something else uh, that, that, uh, that I was thinking at the time um, and that was, that was quite important, which is that um, Google is also a company that historically has kind of um, uh, done, done business by running massive online services. And um, I think it's not a coincidence that, um, that they were also at the forefront of this new kind of AI because this new kind of AI was very, very data hungry. And, uh, you know, it requires massive amounts of training data and massive amounts of computation to train. And, you know, they had giant data centers and they had giant amounts of data. Um, so, uh, so, you know, it made a kind of sense that, that, they were, that they were at the forefront of it. And I don't want to diminish Jeff Dean's, you know, sort of vision with respect to that. I mean, they had to have the right talent to recognize this, but that was one of the reasons that that, that opportunity was there to seize. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I felt like, um, you know, we, we were facing two possible kinds of AI futures. One in which these giant neural nets were all run centrally as services. Uh, you know, there's sort of a small number of AIs, if you want to put it that way, that, that, are, that are serving everybody. Um, and another in which it's much more decentralized and, and, you know, you and I have our personal AIs and, you know, every company, every room in your house, you know, has an AI. It's more like a society of, of decentralized AIs. And I, I really uh, wanted to tip things in favor of the second uh, uh, rather than the first alternative of, of, decent, of decentralization. And I, I felt like um, if I went to Google and tried to push for that decentralized approach, you know, my odds might not be great because it was running so counter to the culture of the, of the company as it had existed heretofore. On the other hand, if I could succeed in making it, that kind of change at Google, that would really matter. Um, and, and I thought I'd rather take my chances, you know, at going someplace where I, where I have high, high odds of not succeeding, but where success will matter than staying at a place where, you know, I'm a more known quantity, you know, higher odds of success, but not sure, not sure that any, 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 anything that I do here is going to really, uh, change the future in the same way. Yeah. I think you already answered a couple, like my next five questions, but, uh, so I, I think this was this was a, a wonderful way to see this through your own perspective and the way the vision that you have for w what you're doing right now. And I think the unit is called Cerebra, right? Like Cerebra. Yes. Yes. And um, the AIs that you put out, like um, the AI models, like federated learning and Coral, that enable um, to run AI on a user's device without syncing much. They even work offline. And I think this is this is a wonderful way how you how you describe it how we can maybe change the way people look at ai as this this behemoth you know when we when we look at west world and uh, i think it was called solomon the, the the massive ai that basically ran the world i think right. everyone is very worried about that yeah and i mean I those, think, those, those anxieties go all the way back to like moloch you know and uh, this, yeah. the, the, the sort of uh, you know, it's an science, old science fiction movies thing, of the 20s right. and 30s exactly um, yes it's an industrial revolution anxiety really mm -hmm. One thing that I was curious about, and I think uh, that, that was the two questions that immediately arose, maybe I already answered us partially. One is, how do you decide from, from giving all these priorities and all these possibilities you have at Google, where you put your efforts in, what are you actually releasing? So it's a bit like the, the David Hume's problem, right? So we, we have all these options, but what are actually goes through your mind and through maybe other colleagues at Google? what do you actually put the resources in and you want to release? And what do you want yeah. to keep inside the company? And what do you want to push out there? And then the second question, and maybe it's a bit related, but I think the, the, the problem with AI is that we don't know what's going inside the box. We don't know the reasoning of AI. That's a, that's a core problem right now. It might change over time, but right now mm -hmm. that's, that's a big issue. So we have to constantly validate it. And we are worried about biases. And we, we, we don't know because we would have to basically go through a lot of data ourselves to see what's going on or run a different AI. Mm -hmm. But I feel even if we federalize it, and I like that approach, 
we, we download a standard model that might have all the biases attached. So we, we run it on different devices, but we, we are just modifying an existing model. So we might download other people's biases. And, you know, I'm not talking about racial biases necessarily. It's just decision biases, mm -hmm. biases that we are not aware of. And that, that, that seems as scary as having a central AI to me. Yes. Um, yeah, these are, these are very good questions. So you've asked two giant ones. Let me try and take them uh, one one at a time. We have time. We have time. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, so first of all, you um, you're asking about. Um, well, in, in fact, let, let me let me let me begin by taking the the, um, the bias and fairness uh, and ethics one, and then we can then we can go back and and address the question of uh, you know what what Google releases and and whatnot, um, and and how how that works and and what and what I what I choose you know, to have the team focus on too. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, the question of bias and explainability, they're, they're different questions. Um, let's begin with explainability for neural nets. Uh, so explainability is something that has, is, a, is a question or a charge that has been leveled quite a bit at neural, at neural networks because um, you know, they, they don't look like code. So you can't really step through it in any meaningful way. You know, instead, you have these massive... Um, you know, banks of filters in the case of a convolutional net, for example. Uh, so it's just tons and tons of numbers. And, and you know, and that's, that is the net. And so how do you explain how it makes a decision, you know, about, about how to classify an object or what to reply? Um, you know, it's, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to kind of make a, a, a legalistic uh, sort of sequence of, yeah. of, of deductions about, about, you know, how a certain decision came about. <clears throat> but but um, I guess I would point out a couple of things. One is that in complicated um, real-world software systems, you know, if, if, you, if you ask the question, for example, before neural nets were involved in Google search, when it was all classical computing, you know, how did a ranking decision there get made? That answer would be extraordinarily complex as well. Uh, you know, when you have millions and millions of lines of code uh, you know, that, have get, that have accumulated in order to you know, imp keep continually improve a problem over generations of software developers, you know, all working on bits and pieces of the thing. Um, you know, you also don't end up with an explainable system. Uh, you you end up with something that, in theory, you could you could you know dump a stack trace or whatever. But you know, if you've ever seen a stack trace from I don't know a, a crash on your computer or something, you know that that doesn't look very explainable. You know, in order to in order to debug the simplest sort of problem, you know, memory overrun or something like that, you know, programmers you know might spend months. You know, trying to trying to dig through you know some particular stack trace and what you know and how to reproduce it and what what what. But search problem, right? There is always an expert who knows what to do. Like I have these problems when I do my own development, my own programming, and there's always someone on Stack Overflow who knows this bug and can fix it or on GitHub. But I if, feel if with AI, there is nobody left. Well, there is no not this one expert. If it's if it's a if it's a programming error, uh, then there's generally somebody on Stack Overflow who has seen it before. But if we're talking about some about about a bunch of code that has been written over the years to make a, a judgment call, which is you know what we're talking about now, right? We're not talking about a, a programming error, right? We're sure. talking about judgment calls. Then, um, then I, I think it really is much much more complex. I mean, you know, the kind of questions that we'd be we'd be asking ourselves are like, you know, why did um, you know, why did my business, you know, uh, you know, get the, you know, become the fifth search result as a, you know, as opposed to the third, you know, I mean, I can, yeah. I could answer the question in some kind of pedantic way. Well, this branch of code, that one, that one, that one, but a satisfying explanation would be just as hard yeah. as, <laughs> you know, as if it were a neural net. Uh, and, and, in, and in fact, I, you know, in, in those kinds of cases, I would say that, you know, neural nets are actually um, somewhat, are somewhat easier to, uh, to explain than, than, than large classical code bases, because unlike with a classical code base, you begin with you know, a clear set of training data and a clear objective function that you're trying to optimize. And the answer, you know, so, that, so that, that, is, that is actually quite a compact formulation you know, of, of what and why, you know, like, right, that, that you don't yeah. get from, uh, from, from the accumulation of the choices of thousands of engineers. I don't want a very good argument, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to dodge the the, the explainability uh, challenge because I think it's it's major. But I, I'm pointing out that, you know, we I think we often we often have a, a sort of idealized straw man that we think of as being the explainable case, which is not generally there. <laughs> you know, like we're not starting from an explainable spot either. Okay, um, you're and, right. Uh, and then and then uh, if we if we take this a little bit more meta, you know, I, I would say, you know, we think about um, about about humans and human decisions uh, as being. Uh, explainable um, 
you know, that's, I mean, that's the basis on which the entire legal system is based, right? You, you know, we, 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 you know, if a judge makes a decision, they have to be able to say why, you know, they're, that's, that's what the law is all about, uh, the, you know, fair application of it, etc. Um, a, the law is not fair. And there are many, many studies that, that, that show this very clearly. B, the narrative structures that we impose in order to explain our actions and our decisions um, again, there's a huge body of work in, in, in psychology uh, and, and in legal theory that show, well, in legal theory less than I would like, but in psychology certainly, that show that we're very good at making stories. And those, uh, and, and those stories might rationalize a series of decisions and actions, but um, you know, they're, they're, there's not necessarily the causal relationship there that one might wish. <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, you know, yeah. we're, very, we're very good storytellers, we're very good modelers, we model each other socially, we model ourselves, that what, that's what self-consciousness is. Um, but the idea that that model is the actual underlying thing is completely false. Like you have, you know, trillions of synapses in your, in your probably quadrillions, I, I don't know how many synapses in your brain, um, you know, and, and your model of yourself and of your decision-making processes has nothing to do with you know the detailed you know firing of all of your of all of your neurons and 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 you know a sophisticated model of all of that. It's a story that yeah. you tell yourself. Yeah, stuff. yeah. And this <laughs> is a really good topic. I think we can spend an hour on this. We could. Um, I, I I I love what you say, but I think there is something magical, and I, I want to want to maybe get back to this if we have time to the, mm -hmm. this narrative as a way to not just explaining things, but also as cloud storage are really complex issues. So we, yes. we, we can encode things in extremely, yep. that are extremely complicated and relatively simple. Um, it's like a, like when you have a zip, when you zip a file and it, it's yes. three gigabyte and you encode it into a few, I, I agree. I agree entirely. K. I agree entirely, Torsten. Language is super compact and powerful and you can use yeah. it to uh, not only to reason things through, but also to make changes in your thinking process in a very compact way. Right. Unlike current, uh, current machine learning models, you know, you can say, for example, you know, oh, no, you know, you're in a country now where the where the screw tops on everything twist the other way. You know, uh, so it's, it's clockwise rather than counterclockwise. You just say yeah. that once with those words and, you know, and, and every yeah, and you'll get you'll do the right thing every time from then yeah. forward. Right. So and I think we don't, we don't get has, machine learning models that can do that. But you know. yeah, Elon Musk is on this trajectory where he says language is so inefficient and the encoding doesn't work. I think he's missing the point that I there's agree. a lot of learning that is in, in the layers below that. Yeah. That it is extremely very very efficient compared yeah. to we, we we don't look to have to look at a lot of data to to exactly to your example can can with one abstract um, message can actually change our model completely which is amazing yes. I think machines I'm, I'm, enti I'm entirely yes I'm entirely in your camp about this I think language is enormously powerful and um, uh, both as a way of learning transmitting information uh, you know of building up cultural information over time, uh, which I think is most of what human intelligence is, by the way. I think it's cultural, not individual. Yeah. So um, I'm very much in the same camp. Um, uh, I, I disagree with Elon Musk strongly on this. And, and I think that, um, you know, the language models, I mean, you were, you were asking earlier about GPT-3. I think that I think that the progress that we're now making with language models is bringing us closer to a world in which, you know, you can have exactly that kind of discourse. Uh, with with machines and and that's very important for explainability as well as for efficiency of learning and all kinds of other things. Yeah. Circling back for a moment, before we go into these deeper issues, when I I looked at Coral, right? So that's one of the software packages you release, and I think this is an open source release. Yes. Um, I was really excited, and I thought, "Oh my gosh, I can I can just build crazy AI with it." But in the end, the models that come with it, I can do my own models. You know, I can train whatever I want. But the pre predefined models that are already available on the website right now, they're really boring. They're object recognition, right? They're they, they're so basic. I felt like they, they I read something from the seventies. So we we talk about AI. It's gotten finally got its it's in the limelight, right? And we feel yeah. like it's taking off. But then I look at Coral, which seems extremely powerful because of this federated model that you can run it on each device. And I was expecting things like, I don't know, cancer recognition or something really powerful, right? right. And it wasn't in that prepackaged model. It doesn't mean you can't do it with it. But I was kind of hoping there is some science fiction in this. Why, mm -hmm. why don't we have the science fiction on our hands yet? It's a good question. Uh, and this, this sounds like it speaks to your, your other question about you know, what we release, what we don't release, and so on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so first of all, um, th there, there is actually a coral demo for, uh, for online cancer uh, detection. Um, I, I don't think that it's yeah. a model that we have, we have publicly released. And the reasons for that are that um, 
the kinds of liability that come with, uh, you know, with with Google releasing a cancer recognition model are, you know, I mean, that, that's a that's a medical that's a medical grade thing that requires uh, a level of study studies and validation and uh, you know and and regulation that you know historically the company has not um, has not been prepared to take on. That is changing with Google Health. Uh, so you know we we do now have collaborations going on uh, you know with with Google Health on you know in, in in these kinds of areas, but it's a long, slow, arduous process. Uh, you know if if you were to ask me like do you, do you think that <laughs> do you think that 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 all might be a little bit overregulated? I, I think the answer is probably yes. Uh, you know there are reasons that we have heavy health regulations. It's to avoid um, you know unsafe unsafe drugs and unsafe medical procedures from making their way out into the world it's to avoid tuskegee experiment kinds of horrors so there are good reasons for all of this but um you know but it also means that innovation uh, in that space can be very very slow it's one of the reasons that i'm you know delighted that the that the vaccines managed to happen so quickly you know, despite despite all of this i guess when we really care we can we can fast track things but it's it's hard um but but more but more broadly you know you're saying like um you know that's right we have you know object recognition uh, very simple um speech recognition very simple you know person counting you know this doesn't seem very sci-fi right it seems like it seems like stuff from the 70s um there were models in the 70s that did this kind of stuff, although um, although none of them none of them with anything like the quality that a deep neural net can. So you know they're they're doing old problems uh, with much higher quality. But uh, the reason that we that we focused on those very workaday things for Coral specifically is because you know it, Coral is not really so much about um, about sort of being cutting edge with respect to what the AI is doing. So much as being cutting edge about how it's doing it. So that project specifically is for solving problems like, you know, if you want to put a sensor uh, in a, um, uh, you know, in a department of motor vehicles or something that that says how long the line is, uh, you know, the, how long is the, the queue, uh, you know, in front of the desk, and, and you know, for 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 that to go on 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 a on a public website or something like this, then it would be nice to have a system for doing that. That's very simple and appliance-like, and where all of that computation, you know, that turns the video into this integer, you know, of how many people in the line, all happens yes. locally in a way that doesn't violate privacy. So, you know, it's very workaday problems like Q, like Q lengths and, and so on that you know that are that are really at, at play here. You know, that's that's 90 percent of what, uh, you know, of what of what clients of this kind of stuff want. And what we wanted to do was show that those things were possible to do without setting up uh, surveillance systems that have all kinds of negative side effects. Um, so you know, it's it's a different sort. It's not that's not the sort of cutting edge research on, on neural net architectures or or, uh, or applications, but more um, yeah. sort of you know, let's take the things that everybody needs and that are common, you know, among many many industries, and show a different way of doing those. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you know, obviously there are, there are researchers in, in 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 my team and in various other parts of Google research that um, that work on on much more sophisticated applications, or you know, and, and you know. Architectures that do things that are really kind of shocking, uh, and, that, and that are a little more science fictiony than counting people, uh, you know, or, or recognizing smiles, um, and uh, and most of those, uh, most of that work gets published, uh, you know, in in um, in very short order. So you know, there's a huge number of papers that come out yeah. of Google research, um, and uh, and many of them nowadays are coming out with code as well. So you know, so you know, it's reproducible and and it's you know, it's it's part of the open research community. Um, there are some checks and balances on what comes out. I mean, you, you mentioned GPT-3, the OpenAI team decided when they made that, that, that there were some dangers in releasing that model, uh, you know, and that it could be weaponized um, in certain ways. Uh, so, you know, that's the main thing that we think about, uh, you know, before, before releasing, you know, are there, are there risks, uh, are there dangers to making one of, these, one of these things public? But by and large, we're very, uh, we're very open. Uh, about about what we publish. Yeah, I think the the, the humanity owes Google, um, and I think we reward Google very nicely with this yes. with the market cap. So I think it goes both ways, and the really cheap loans, you know, zero percent interest rate that were meant for struggling airlines, and Google gets them anyways. So I think it goes both ways. There's a lot of love uh, currently. I think where the love is 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 a little bit in doubt is a topic, and you just mentioned that is the question that we all feel like. That we become, we become, we are fully surveilled, and 
that's true. There's all this data there. We, we used to not care about it, but there's not much, so much data now, there's so many, many more sensors and so much AI that's running that kind of reads our brains better than we can read it. So people are becoming a little bit concerned. And obviously Google says, well, we need that data to, to sustain our business. We give you free, free services. And I think everyone is kind of okay with this initially. And then you realize, oh my gosh, there's like 2,000 data points that can Google can read from you. And right. using those 2,000 data points, they know you exactly. Like there's no doubt when you get married, they know the date before you even propose. So it's really scary um, yeah. how this, 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 this tech works because what we are creatures of habit, we are social creatures, so we, we behave more like other people than we believe in our, ourselves. But we have this illusion of free will. We don't think this should be the case, right? And I know Google does a lot of anim animization and it plays around with um, with um, giving people their privacy, but in the end, they need the data to make money. And, they, and there's always a market for alternative data. Like I was just talking a couple of episodes ago, how many more startups are now coming up with alternate data. And like every sensor, basically you can create a company around it. So you sell this data and then you will make money from this. Maybe not trillions, but a couple of million is always in the game. And the question is, it's not really a Google issue. I think everyone has that issue, but Google, yeah. because it's better, it's more hat. Um, how do you think this will play out? Will people eventually rebel against this surveillance um, industry that we are in? And that especially Facebook, I think Facebook is the worst offender right now, but you know, everyone has the same problem. Yeah. Will, do you think that is actually drawn lines? Because I feel like everyone who draws up these lines is 10 years behind. So by the time these lines are drawn up and say, okay, you can't have this data, like what happened in the European Union, it's on the web, nobody cares about web data anymore. You just don't care, You just you, because device data is what people want, or sensor data. And they are not even covered by GDPR potentially. And then the reality is always 10, 15, 20 years ahead of what's just regulated. So is this a cat and mouse game that will keep going on forever? This is a great question. Uh, and it's very, it's very close to my heart because you know, I mean, the, the concerns that you're raising are exactly the, the ones that brought me to Google and that and that and that kicked off, you know, all of the work of my team. I mean, they, they, they animate all of the work of my team. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I want to before before I dig in and, and answer in detail, I want to step back for a second and um, uh, and and also just um, reset the critique a little bit, perhaps. Uh, so I mean, I've, I've read. Um, uh, Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism with a lot of interest and, and many of the other books that, that, um, that raise these kinds of critiques. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm friends with quite a few people uh, outside Google who, you know, who are very, very vocal um, uh, advocates for privacy and, and, and very sharp critics of, of Google and companies like it. Um, but uh, and and then there was the sort of pop, you know the, the social dilemma was probably the popularization of a lot of these ideas uh, right yeah. about a year ago or something. Um, so the social dilemma um, posits you know it has this kind of recurring animation of a of a sort of puppet uh, that is that is um, you know like a, a, an animatronic version of you that that lives in the data center and that becomes so precise that you can be uh, predicted completely. And uh, and that and that's then the basis for kind of futures market in, in, in your behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I I want to so that is a terrifying vision, um, but I also want to um, temper it with with the reality, which is that um, you know yeah I, I actually don't believe that people are as as uh, unpredictable or unlike each other as they are individualistic as they believe. I mean I'm a critique of individualism you know in multiple senses. I think a lot of what a lot of our, where our intelligence really lies is social and societal and not really individual at all. Um, but yeah. at the same time, if we, if we imagine that these models are all seeing and all powerful and understand you know, all of our hopes and dreams and wishes better than we do, um, I, I think, I think that, that is not the universe that, that really obtains uh, inside these companies. It's almost the opposite problem. Uh, I know because there, there, you know, there are a couple of teams, in, you know, within my own group, within Cerebra, that that have done um, personalization models for, you know, for other parts of the of the company. It's not the kind of work that I generally have people in in my team doing for reasons we'll get into, but um, but you know, I I do know how that sausage is made, and they're actually not that great. You know, the the problem with with um, recommendation streams and things is not that they that they are. Um, you know, so prescient that they know you so well that, you know, that they can anticipate your every interest, but rather that they're too simple uh, and too reductive 
Um, yeah. And, you know, and frankly, that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I believe that we end up with a kind of a simplified discourse, right? And in, 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 in a lot of social media, and, you know, kind of the polarization, right? That, that, that sort of polarization and simplification of the discourse comes because of, um, of emergent behaviors. It's not just the, the ML systems, yeah. but emergent behaviors that the ML systems are part of that are highly reductive and that just sort of funnel people into a small number of modes, you know, rather than, rather than having a real model of Torsten and what might interest yeah. him. And, you know, right. What, what, I mean, uh, you know, in some sense, a really good ML model would have, would have a very different effect, I believe. Than, I fully uh, agree. I fully agree. I think this is one of the, 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 the one of the things that are least understood about what happened since 2015, since yeah. uh, we, we are basically motivated by an engagement algorithm that Facebook exactly. invented, so to speak, and then rolled exactly. out publicly. And the deflation of likes is my theory has really led to this depression of the last five, six years, mental depression, not necessarily yeah. economical. Now we have the economical too. I, but, I agree. I agree with that. And, and, the, and, and the, the incentive is always there to give you the thing that you're most likely to click on, right? So there's, a, there's yeah. an anti-explore, pro-exploit sort of bias built it, into It's terrible. Like, so it's terrible right. what it led to. I think it was well-intended. And I, I, if I would have worked at Facebook at the time, I would have propagated that too. And I wanted to right. push this out. But it's terrible. But there, there were unintended happened. consequences. Yeah. To humanity, right. Absolutely. So they are not Absolutely. evil, I would say, the engineers. But they, they're also a little, they need some help from psychologists and people who think a little bit outside the box. But you they, know, they, they all do. want to make money. So they do. I although, although the idea, although the idea that um, the idea that psychologists have the answers or ethicists have the answers or whatever is also is also false. I think. True. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, none of us could have predicted. Uh, you know, I, I say that I'm sure that there were some predictions, you know, that were accurate, you know, even even in the very, very early days. But I suspect that they were drowned in the noise of many, many other predictions that, you know, that didn't, didn't come to pass. Um, well, if you I, read Socrates, I think you would have made that prediction in a heartbeat because you realize that 90 percent out there will have different opinions and engagement and, and like this this five second engagement not the same as the five hour or five day engagement sure. if someone comes up to measure this right what actually sticks on what 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 stays in our mind instead of what we just click on in the first five seconds i think that's the holy grail then you can solve it but i want I, to I, I agree and, and like so so like two people i mean two modern thinkers who i think could you know could probably have done a pretty good job of predicting it are danny kahneman and amos okay. kersky uh, right so kahneman kersky is you know I, they're like fast thinking slow thinking sort of thing you know that that up, was yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't. Th I don't think it was completely unpredictable. But I also think that a lot of these are emergent effects. You know, I mean, sure. if we think, if we think about, for example, the genocides, uh, you know, in in Myanmar, uh, you know, and 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 that, you know, and and social media as having been a major factor in the way those came about. You know, yeah. it's. Um, I mean, that's that's, you know, that's Facebook and WhatsApp, I believe. Um, you know, and 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 something extraordinarily evil uh, came out of that. But the idea that there is a single actor that you can pin the blame for it on, I think is, is a little bit, um, it's yes, also I a mean, little bit but we need... you know, it's an emergent, it's an emergent you know, phenomenon. Right. You know, Rene Girard, that's how the mind works, yeah. right? So we need the scapegoat and then the scapegoat actually saves exactly. us. So we, that's, that's how mind used to work over such a long time and it seemed to, to, to relieve us of that pressure because we can exactly. actually move on because we have the scapegoat. So exactly. it, it moves around who is that scapegoat. But I wanted to say, the individual AI certainly is reductive. And when I look at the code, I think this is just random nonsense. So why would anyone worry about this? But the problem is, from a consumer, it looks different, right? Yeah. So say Alexa listens to you, and then Amazon gives you their predictions about cat food. But I don't have a cat, but I get cat food ads the next day because I talked about cats. And I, that I maybe wanted a cat. Or I, I there is. The, Maybe it's a lucky thing, right? So it's it's ninety nine percent of the ads still. I feel I'm not very well targeted, and they come all the time the same ads on YouTube. But mm -hmm. there is this day where I think, oh man, this is really creepy, creepy. Yeah. And then yeah. as a, as a person, I extrapolate this one event that's statistically yeah. not relevant. I but that's where you but that's where you pin the sense of creepiness uh, onto. Right. Yeah, and then for me, all the ads are creepy. Yeah. I mean, this is how human recognition works. Like we see one one accident on the freeway, and we think driving is dangerous. But then two weeks later, we think no driving isn't dangerous. So there's right. something weird in our mind that it's very different than the statistical driven learning that AIs have. It is. And I it think is. engineers also have in their mind. They think, oh, it's not relevant. But no, it is relevant because you only get a few shots, and then people just they just sign off because they, they think I, it's I agree. creepy. Well, and you're you're talking about you know just from a sort of PR perspective or a business perspective, why it's relevant. I mean, I think it's relevant for two reasons, neither of which is about just big statistics. One of them yeah. is chilling effects and, and, and our sense of our sense of, of individual agency. 
um, and our ability to be ourselves and to have you know to have a, that that sense of privacy. Right, it's not the same as security. It's not the same as as secrecy. Privacy is a you know is a real thing. Anybody who lived through, uh, you know, the DDR, uh, you know, or other surveillance states understands, you know, what it what it feels like to be uh, to be in a uh, in a society where you don't where you don't have privacy. It's and and it's it, it feels it feels awful. Uh, it feels awful even if nothing is done with the information, or even if the surveilling entity doesn't have any any problem with you, right? Or doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't have it have it in for you. Um, yeah. But but the other the, you know the other and even more serious problem besides chilling effects and the psychology of all of that and the importance of privacy from a psychological standpoint is that if you have if any entity has the kinds of of, of records that that we're talking about, like let's say that you have a you know uh, a device you know, in your house that is listening to you all the time and, 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 uh, and storing records somewhere in the cloud mm -hmm. of everything that is said in that house, um, that is a, um, like a sort of Democles hanging over your head. Um, yeah. And it has very real civil liberties implications. Um, you know, even, if, even if, if the stewardship of that data is in the hands of a really good steward, uh, you know, it's still, um, it's still black mirror territory. And, yeah. and and if reg if regimes change, uh, you know, if, if liberal democracy starts to uh, starts to collapse, uh, you know, and those things are there, um, then you know you can go to a really dark place societally. So I th I think these are, I, you know, I I'm, I mean when I push back on like you know the, the models are not that good, et cetera, I'm I'm not pushing back on the on the problems of surveillance. I think they're I think they're they're very real and 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 they very much animate you know my work as I was saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it from, from, from Friedrich Hayek's perspective, you know, that you have to be free of coercion. That's the goal. Right. Because right. we know that in that, that area, we develop the best. And this is not an altruistic goal or that, that I'm concerned necessarily. I mean, I am concerned about humanity, but it's not necessarily a, like, a, like an empathy thing for me. It is, if we don't achieve this, we will all suffer and we will die. Right? Someone who, who's going to do it better will take over. That seems to be the learning from history. If you have mm -hmm. an entity, like I saw this for myself, Growing up in, in the DDR in Eastern Germany, we had the perfect example. You take the same kind of people, you put one in socialism and they're very restrictive, um, yeah. but very utopian, very, very well intended and very efficient in that sense, very efficient bureaucracy. And then you have the other side, which also has efficient bureaucracy, but much less and let it develop freely. After 15 years, the, 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 the verdict was out. Everybody diverged was going right. on. And right. you, it was never even close to coming back. To surprise yeah. of a lot of people who were so enthusiastic about it, like my own parents who were very enthusiastic about socialism, communism, but it would, it, it doesn't work because it's coercion and these the static models, they just don't work for long term. I, mm -hmm. I think we as humans instinctively know that. I think this is why yeah. we crave this freedom so much. Yeah, I I, um, I agree with you. And there, there are studies. I mean, they're they're small n, and uh, you know, I would need to go back and, and look in detail. But even things like rates of organ donation. Uh, varied quite a bit between East and West Germany, uh, you know, I, I mean, paradoxically, because you would think that in, in a communist and socialist environment, you know, there would be more willingness to do for others. But in, in fact, you know, those psycho that psychological weight, those chilling effects seem to actually push the other way. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not, a, I mean, to be clear, like, I am not personally, I mean, this is my own views, it's not Google or whatever, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually a you know, very much a proponent of universal basic income and other kinds of socialism, but yeah. um, but I, I, I don't, don't think that's I very socialist. I I I love no. UBI by now. I don't think it's very socialist. But the, the social model, what I'm worried about, the socialist model is the restrictions that you had to put on it to keep right. the model alive, right? Giving you're, you're, people you're worried, free well, healthcare and free sure. free bread is not a bad is not a bad thing. It's never worse. Right. So I think we're in the same spot. I mean, I, I I worry about surveillance. I worry about limiting freedom. I worry about chilling effects. Um, you know, there's there's lots of there's lots of right things like things like free healthcare, free education, uh, you know, universal basic income are, are are kind of orthogonal to those to those points. Um, yeah, right. I want to I want to go into one thing that I I've been thinking about, and you know, I had um, one of the founders of GPT three was on another podcast. He wasn't here, and he one of the. OpenAI developers, he basically said, you know, there is a really good chance that GPT-5 can look to basically everyone on this planet like it, like it is conscious, like it has mm -hmm. a real um, idea of what's going on. It could be very human-like, and not just in a, in a Turing test, but, but everyone who interacts with it in a digital way. Yeah. And one thing I think that's missing from GPT-3, it knows so much, 
well, we don't say knows, but it gets so many things right that looked like poetry to us, but it's kind of random. So people say, well, this is just a random outcome of statistics. And if you shoot enough darts, some of them will look like poetry, right? So that's, that's, that's kind of the answer. But what he said is that what's missing is the user correction, right? Is the Google click stream, Google, Google search engine. A lot of mm-hmm. people say, you might correct me, is not just the AI and everybody now could come up with the same AI. The, the benefit that they have is that they have the click stream and the click stream reduces, like say the AI is only 90% correct or 80% correct. It, with every iteration, it gets better because it takes into account the click stream. So basically humans become basically just error clicking machines, so to speak, to the real AI. And that's what he said with GPT-5, taking into account all this user feedback which they don't have yet, and they're very weird in releasing it. I feel that's a mistake, but that's obviously their their call. But once they have enough user feedback and they get to 100% or 99.99% of correct decisions, he said nobody on this planet might be able to figure out if this is an AI or not. When you say when you say um, correct decisions, I mean I'm I'm. Um... Well, I mean, human-like I decisions, right. or, or like, I mean, like better than human. Let's put it this way. So there's never any correct decision, so to speak. It, it's it's. Um, I mean, I, th- I think it's a pu- it's a puzzling framing. Um, I, I think I disagree with it. Um, okay. I don't dis- I don't disagree, by the way, that that um, you know that GPT five or you know if not GPT five GPT ten or whatever will you know absolutely be able to pass the Turing test. I I, I think that's I think that's highly likely. Yeah. Um, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, the the uh, the progress you know in language models has been ast- astonishing. Um, I think it's a very interesting question to ask. You know, well, if you can't tell wh- whether you know that there isn't anybody home, does that mean that there is somebody home? You know, yeah. right? This is a you know that's a profound question. It's basically the it's similar to the question of whether there is such a thing as a philosophical zombie, and you know we could certainly spend some time on that one. Um, you know, uh, Turing's own relationship with that question. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that. The Turing test is sometimes a little bit misunderstood. Um, you know, it really is basically is saying something like, you know, faking it is making it, and uh, the parallel has sometimes been drawn with his with his uh, sexuality, as well. You know, like what, what does it mean to pass? Uh, you know, to pass as straight or, or or what have you. You know, is there a difference right on on, on the inside or not? Uh, you yeah. know, he was saying, you know, perhaps tongue in cheek, perhaps not, that you know, if, if you can, that that nobody else can know what is inside you. So if you can behave, you know, in in way X, Y, or Z, right? Then, that, you know, then what, who's to say that there's anything else, you know, anything other than that, that you know, that is reality, right? That that is empirical equals reality. Yeah. You know, um, so that's a, that's a really interesting question. But the you know that this is going to get you know quote unquote solved by having a, a metric or a number that goes up and up and up, and that the way to get the metric or the number right is to interact with billions of people billions of times, strikes me as as um, as a little bit of, of a mixed metaphor or taking a, an approach or an idea that worked in one context and applying it in a place where we have no reason to believe that it will work. Um, I mean, that's not how humans work. That's not why we are what we are. Um, you know, we're not the aggregation of, you know, trillions of interactions, uh, you know, with, with, with lots and lots of other humans that tell us when something is human-like and not human-like. That's that. That's not how. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But because you know, when I think of children, what they do is they download culture. As you said earlier, we are cultural beings. We are not. We are not a computing engine. But we outsource computing long time ago to the cloud, other people. So what we do is we we download all this knowledge, which is kind of the model, right? That's the standard model. And then we go out in the world and we refine the model. We we generate our own layer of better models on top of that. But still, most of the knowledge generation. I think this is really popular lately that people say, especially economists, say you can't be better than, than what's already out there. Say so you come up with a new theory, I don't know, you say something political and people say, no, how would you know? Because it's impossible because all the information is already in the market. You basically, there's no way you can advance on anything because it's already in an equilibrium. It's already out there. So the, the market is full of information. So people say, well, I basically... I direct my own decision making to what is the mainstream consensus. Kind of the people say that's more female like but male like, but I think this is very popular now where people say, I don't want my own opinion. I just look at whatever news feed who's most authoritative, say I look at hacker news for, for certain uh, hack, hacker news, so to speak. So I always find the source of authoritative news and this is what I adopt unquestionably because by definition I can't be better. And but those are actually other other humans, right? So we outsource yeah. knowledge generation to other 
two other humans and we have this tiny tiny sliver where maybe we add some actual knowledge but for most people this is more theoretical than practical they don't really interact in this knowledge economy as, as an input they just consume it mm -hmm. and i think this is kind of the same what, what i see with ai very very soon right so so they they don't learn from from their own experience really they are 99999 percent from other machines and i think this resembles our human homo sapiens approach perfectly well, um, I, I mean, I, I guess the I first question I would me. ask. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, no. I mean, it's it's. I, I think your your. I mean, your theory is is interesting. It's one. It's one that um, I have. I, or I've heard things sort of like it articulated before. It is different from the way I think about it. Um, okay. We we um, we're not. I mean, first of all, we're not trying to optimize something. I mean, I think this is this is a common misconception. Um, you know, when we build ML systems, generally we do have a specific loss function. You know, a specific thing that we're trying to optimize. Yeah. Um, uh, although with unsupervised learning, which actually is gaining a huge amount of traction now, it's not always so clear what what that is, and and that's it's also not so clear with with GANs. Or well, the loss function is survival systems, for humans, right? So, but we can do the same thing for for, for machines eventually, right? There is a I, propagation of knowledge to the next generation. I, 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 I disagree. Uh, I don't. I don't think that. I don't think that survival is is nature's loss function. Um, I. I mean. How can I? How can I? Uh, how can I put this? Um, think about. Um, I, I actually talked a bit about this in my in my uh, in my Neurips keynote from um, uh, from twenty nineteen um, from December yeah. or November twenty nineteen, but um, I, I think that I think that it's actually fairly easy to disprove uh, mathematically. That, that we that we that we lack that life lacks a loss function, and and the way the way to notice it is as follows: um, you aren't an, uh, a sort of agent in a static environment. Uh, you know, really, what we have are societies. We have groups of agents, you know, interacting with each other, and you know, even your own brain is a group of agents, if you like. You know, it's neurons interacting with each other. You know, they have their own yeah. lives. You know, every cell in your body has its own life. And it's kind of it's kind of like those it's societies all the way all the way up and down if you want to think about it that way you know from from single cells to what we think of as organisms to what we think of as societies, and and so now you know you already have to ask the question well survival of what exactly you know like what what is the thing that is being optimized so for instance um, you know the the cells in your body you know what are they optimizing for I mean they obviously you know they obviously um, are they have to work together. Uh, in order to keep you alive, and the fact that you are alive in an organism and nourishing them means that they can sort of relax. They can lower their guard in certain regards, right? They're, they don't have the same hard life that an amoeba has, you know, where it has to kind of go and, and, and do everything on its own. But yeah. the idea that every cell in your body is trying to optimize for its survival is is certainly wrong. Your your neurons uh, do live do live for your you know some of your neurons at least live for your entire lifespan. Uh, the cells in your cheek, uh, you know, or in your gut. Um, you know, turn over very, very rapidly. They're not trying to live as long as they can. In fact, when, when cells flip over to the dark side and try to live as long as they can, we call that cancer. Yeah. Um, you know, and, 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 um, and in fact, anytime you have, you know, entities interacting with each other, even if they each have their own loss functions, what you actually get out of that is a dynamical system uh, in which there's a kind of uh, predator-prey dynamics, if you like, or, or pursuit uh, kind of dynamics. And and those dynamics have uh, what you would call in, in math vorticity, meaning that the trajectories in whatever kind of phase space you choose to look at it from uh, curl around each other. They curve. They're chaotic. And, yeah. and, and the thing is that you know, anything that has curl or that has chaos of that sort does not look like gradient descent. Uh, you know, any kind of gradient descent process has zero curl and is all divergence. Um, yeah. So, you know, when something is curled, when something is chaotic, that, that means that, means that um, that you can't actually talk about the about uh, about something that is being optimized at that large. There's no scale. pattern. Yeah. Well, no, there, is I, a, there I is a pattern. There is a pattern, but there isn't. You can't say such and such is being optimized for. And and by the way, this is okay. a, a, the a theory that uh, economists, the 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 Nobel winning economist Kenneth Arrow, um, you know, what he won his Nobel for was a series of impossibility theorems about voting. Uh, this is from way back, I think, in the forties, and it was exactly the same observation that that you can't have a perfect voting system. Because, you know, whenever you have a bunch of people, uh, you know, kind of uh, de developing consensus, right, through voting, you can no longer say, you know, what is the entire, that, that the entire vote is, is fair or is, or is optimal in any sense, no matter what the voting system is. I, I wanted to get at something 
along those lines, and I, I, I'm not sure if the cell level is the best because we're looking at the, the individual level, right? That's where the loss function, in my mind, should come into play. But, but what, what about I wanted to get at, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's when there's a lot of fear that, say, assume we have these super intelligent machines in five years, not realistic, right? But 50 mm -hmm. years, maybe 5,000 years, 100%. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of fear about this. And the best, and I had David Orban on, he says, you don't have to fear it, you just, you, you become a hybrid, right? So you become transhuman. Um, mm -hmm. And that has a really bad ring to it because we know that humans survived so well through all these challenges. So now we create something that could squash us like we are ants to them, right? That is, that is um, Sam Harris's um, um, TED talk. And yeah, Sam so Harris has, has argued this. Of course, uh, Nick Bostrom has argued this as well in Superintelligence. Yeah, yeah I, but I here's, here's my answer to this fear <laughs> is, Machines have the same problems we have, right? So they won't just go out and just optimize for very different functions than we are. Our function, and you say it's not, but to an extent, our function is that we want to survive and populate the universe, kind of, right? So we want to create something more productive tomorrow than we have today. Whatever productivity means, it's maybe machines, it's technology, it's better, better knowledge, better philosophy. I think this is definitely... A, uh, something we, 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 we did, uh, if we really optimize for it, it's a good question. Um, and I think machines have the same problem. So morality, uh, software upgrades like religion, um, hardware upgrades like better organs. Tristan, uh, like can, 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 I, I, I mean, can I pause you for a moment and just ask a, ask a, a, you know, a seemingly off-topic question? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you, you are, um, I, I just, I feel like there, there are some hidden assumptions in what you're saying that, that I'm, that I question. Um, okay. I mean, are, what do you think is the number of children that actually do you, do you have children of your own? I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how many? I have twins. Two. You have you have two. Uh, you realize that that's only at replacement level. That's not growth. Yes. So far, yes. Do you intend to have more? Yes. Um, and uh, do you think that do you think that as a whole in society, um, you know, people in the developed world, which I you know I think you would argue is progress, right, or is, you know, uh, right, represents some kind of arrow. Um, yeah. Do you think that that is a growth population as a whole? You know, that, that, that is to say that, 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 that developed countries are out competing in numerical terms, the, the less developed countries that, that are, you know, quote, unquote, uh, less advanced? Currently, no, no. And why is that? That is a good question. Um, because I, we, have more we, we have more resources, we, we have more resources. So if it's all about survival and yeah. growth, then why would we not be having twice as many children? We could, right? We have we have well, more money to feed them. You know, maybe the maybe problem? the level to look at is not developed countries versus not developed countries. It's communities within those that follow a certain belief system. But because okay. countries are relatively random assignment, especially outside of the uh, um, of Europe, but even Europe, it's pretty random. And people think about borders. There were no borders just 100 years ago and 200 years ago that the, the uh, that's, idea that's, was of a nation state was that's not true. even formulated. That's true. But if we look at wrong level to look at. But if we look at if we look at at all of the countries on the earth by GDP uh, and, you know, you make that one axis and you make the other axis fertility, you will see an extremely clear relationship whereby um, at, at high GDP fertility plummets relative yeah. to at low GDP. Yeah. Um, so why? But to be honest, I would love to know the answer. Um, we, we see, we see this, there's, a, there's a lower childbirth rates. Um, people want less children. So they yes. do a lot of work to only have one or two children. Yes, yes. And they also go into, there's an enormous amount of infertility in, and that maybe it might be slightly age related, but yes. it's, it's huge compared to 100 years ago, especially yes. with men. But it doesn't exist in a developing world that seemed to have way more pollution from from really broad stroke observations, not down to, to the individual. So there seems to be some dynamic at play. I don't know if it's nature. I don't know if it's humans, if it's some maybe super eye that controls us. Once we reach a certain level, fertility drops off voluntarily or involuntarily. It just goes almost to zero. Yes. Um, I, the, the data point is correct. Uh, they, they, they do. Our world in data has very good, has very good uh, sort of charts and graphs about all of this. And, um, do you know the I mean, answer? I, I do. Uh, or at least I think I know the answer. Um, okay. I, I mean, largely it's about choice. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, you know in, in much less developed countries, uh, you know, uh, women generally have fewer rights. 
um, birth control and um, you know and other kinds of fertility controls uh, are 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 fewer and or harder to get, um, and um, you know and and uh, the the age of marriage and the age of first of first childbirth are much lower as well, um, and basically you know less less agency is being exercised, especially by women, uh, of of how many of how many children they have, and in the and the absence of agency, you know basically. You know, I mean, the the, the the maximum fertility, right, is is just you know that all sex is unprotected, and you know you you have babies at the maximum possible rate, and and then you'll end up with, um, you know, a dozen or or, or more, um, uh, per uh, per couple, um, yeah. and 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 in in developed countries, you know, the reason to first order that we don't have all of those babies is because people choose not to. And 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 I, I raise this because uh, you know this absolutely flies in the face of this uh, of this sort of growth oriented or Darwinian uh, you know thesis that you're propounding that the, the that the point of life is uh, you know is is sort of is is um, to maximize uh, you know numbers maximize volume it's it's I mean when when the moment we we are able to choose that is not in fact what we choose uh, we we, ch we choose something else yeah I don't know because. I don't know if we really can choose this enough or if that's something that's given to us. When you look into, into you know, we, we, we doubled population for, say, 4 billion to 9 billion. You say, oh, that yeah. wasn't voluntary, right? Well, you can say that. But then it's always who wins these struggles between groups of humans. Well, it's typically the one okay. that's more productive. And who's more productive? The one that's more innovative. You can not have long-term productivity growth without innovation. Uh, so that also goes back to this Darwinian argument that there is something in us that if we don't optimize for survival, we don't survive. And you could say, well, maybe that's okay, then you just die. But we, we've managed to, to stick around <clears throat> for so long. But why, why, do we, why do we, short -term uh, why do we, why is it, why is it that in, you know, in, in, in advanced countries, we make accommodations for people with disabilities? And so on. I mean, like, like the, the argument that you're making seems to be that it's, you know, it's it's rather close to eugenic kinds of arguments, uh, you know, as well. And and no, I, I'm wondering um, I'm wondering what role that you know why why we would bother, right, to keep people alive who are who are no longer of breeding age or who have genetic uh, you know problems you know which many of us do right or or, or who are disabled. Well, breeding. What's the point? Breeding. Breeding isn't the only thing that helps you in a Darwinian sense, right? So that's obviously something you wanna you wanna um, that's part of this on a biological level, but there is superpowers in, in people's brains and we know this from lots of like physicists especially mm -hmm. that seem to have a, a big group of people who are disabled um, or maybe then the general population who are extremely they have extreme gifts to humanity and you enable them by having them being able to input to society and I don't think I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I don't think that most disabled people are Stephen Hawking's <laughs> but no probably um, not but they could you never know and there, there's, you know, any disability that we call disability might be a great ability in another window that we don't see, right? So just, we just, don't know I feel, like, I feel like you're trying, you're, I feel like you're trying to look at everything through a lens of utility. And that really is what I'm pushing back against. I, I think yeah. that, I think that this framework of utility is very limiting and, for, and, and kind of when we start to really pursue it causes us to contort ourselves in, or, in all sorts of rather, of rather odd ways. I, I just... You know, I mean, whether we are choosing this individually, choosing it as a society, I mean, those are interesting questions and, and they, you know, and I, I don't think there's actually a simple answer, you know, to where agency lies in any of this. But, um, but what does seem, you know, pretty clear to me from looking at, at nature as a whole, not just, not just humans role in it, but, you know, all kinds of animals and plants and so on, is that this idea that, um, you know, that everything is just in competition with everything else and everything is trying is trying you know is trying to just survive at all costs and you know and 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 if everything else dies that's that's favorable to it you know because it creates more space in the ecosystem or whatever i just i just think that's not that's not how it works i feel like there are economic arguments against this there are ecological arguments against this there are mathematical arguments against this there are empirical arguments against it I, even darwin realized it i think that i think that the um you know this highly utilitarian uh, you know kind of optimization based approach came more from spencer than it did from from darwin uh, and in fact uh, some of the russian thinkers uh, i'm thinking i'm thinking of of um uh um I'm thinking of, of Kropotkin, of Peter, Peter Kropotkin, wrote about, um, about sort of a, a more cooperation-minded uh, view of evolution. Uh, you know, so what, is, what does Darwin look like without, without, uh, without Malthus, without, without Spencer? 
Um, and, you know, the answer is not that there is no such thing as competition. Of course, there is competition. But I think what we fail to notice is that competition and cooperation are very, very close and in some sense almost indistinguishable when you look at them from a mathematical point of view. And emergence yes. of, complex, of complexity I comes think from that dance. That. I think we, we absolutely agree on this. I, I had a similar debate with Simon Anhal that I really, really enjoyed. And we, we talked about the nation state and uh, it's on that's his level of, 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 um, of expertise where he really goes into, into a deep dive of data. And right. he says at some point these two things look the same. And I, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, well, the reason, the reason this back, is relevant. Yeah. The reason this is relevant to the AI question is mm -hmm. that is that I think that Nick Bostrom's or Sam Harris's point of view about you know like we're making these AIs, they're the next thing, then then they're going to come and come and kill us, is basically applying sort of a hierarchical chimpanzee thinking to a situation that has long long departed that you know that <laughs> that train station. You know we're, yeah. we've we've been hybridized with machines for a long time. I mean, the fact that you and I, you know, have less fur on our bodies, you know, than, uh, you know, than, than the other great apes has a lot to do with our clothes, which in turn has a lot to do with our machines. Uh, you know, fire, of course, has reshaped the insides of our bodies profoundly and shortened our gut. Um, you know, all of those technologies, right, the, the technologies of language, of culture, you know, we're already so imbricated in all of that. Like, you know, your ability to survive as an individual out there in the jungle is much lamer than, than that of any other great ape. Uh, you know what? What makes it all work is is uh, is your enmeshment with uh, with technology and the way we all work together. And, sure, absolutely. Um, and I, I, think and I we, see, we, I see we AI as being you know, part of that. Yeah, you know, we fully agree on this. You know, this is the the Homo sapiens against Neanderthalis debate on a on a different different level. As uh -huh. least as yeah. we think about that. Yeah, but what I wanted to get at is. It's this fear of people that is real, right? Irrespective of real. you shared yes. or me share, we, we share them. Um, there is, there's an instinctive fear against something else that's more intelligent than us. We don't sure. know what's happening. You can say it's aliens, it could be machines. Yeah. And we, we, talk, we have records while I lose a colleague of yours at, at Google, and he talks about the singularity from a very different point of view. Singularity as something that even he just cannot predict, and he's probably one of the best futurists we have around. He was, had very good predictions in the past. And he basically says, you know, in 2038 and beyond, there is something that could give us this kind of machine, and it makes people scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people have been afraid of this going to happen forever. Uh, well, what do I think? What is going the to happen? The singularity and something that is so so intelligent that we, we might look like ants. To that. I, I I think that I think that um, in some sense we already have crossed that threshold. Um, okay. uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you ask, what is running the economy? For instance, uh, you know, I would argue that it's some something emergent and intelligent that is larger than any single. Like the idea that there are a handful of people. I mean, this is where conspiracy theories come from, right? I mean, you know, anti-Semites believe that there are a handful of Jews running things, you know, or that Soros or you know yeah. or whoever right is in control. And and I think that those those paranoid fantasies are similar to these AI paranoid fantasies in the sense that they imagine that there is a that there is a boogeyman, when in fact what there what there is already. Is um, is a kind of distributed intelligence that is so much greater than any one of us can understand. We are ants, you know, and uh, like, um, yeah. and and uh, you know, so so but things we, like we don't have like a boogeyman we can look up to and say, oh, this is this is a danger to us. We feel like no. we are a danger to ourselves, but that's it. We seem seem I to mean, have that image. Imagine one of your cells, you know, imagining imagining that uh, you know that a super cell is going to come along, you know, that is so much more powerful than it. It would be missing the point entirely. Right. It's that actually the intelligence of your body and of your, of your brain is much greater than the cell could possibly conceive. And I think that's yeah. the world we're already in. Companies are intelligences, I believe. Nation states are intelligences. Uh, you know, even even uh, identity groups. And I, this is one of the reasons that I think that I think that the politics of identity has become such a big deal are collective intelligences. Those already exist and in many ways are, 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 are much bigger than can be understood. Mm -hmm. By a single person yeah. and have will, right? Those those groups. I mean, when we talk about one nation waging war against another, or or a company, you know, acting in a certain way, like that, those are real statements, right? These are actors in a kind of actor yeah. network theory sense, and of course, they're much more intelligent than individual people. Although sometimes they also seem to behave very stupidly, uh, right? I, and the two things can be true simultaneously. Um, but yeah. they're 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 alien. They're bigger, um, but they're also you know, enmeshed with us. We're part of them and, and they're part of us. It's not really separable. When you think of that difficult question, when 
when we, we, we have these intelligent actors, right, and you say they're already here, and we sh this is just another level of another intelligent actor, so we shouldn't worry. Um, because we find I, I'm, some I'm way not, to, to I mean, I'm, work I'm with not, them. I'm not saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't worry, and neither am I saying we have to find some way to work with them. I'm, I'm saying that, you know, when things develop um, at a reasonable rate, uh, yeah. then, uh, you know, a lot of stuff happens. Uh, when I say a lot of stuff happens, I don't, I don't mean everything goes well. You know, I, right? but, I mean, development, development okay. uh, historical development has, has, has always, I mean, we talked about inequality and injustice a little bit earlier. Um, I didn't yeah, want to really misquote you. What, what I wanted to get at yeah, is, <laughs> is this illusion of free will. Is that mm -hmm. the, the other side of that coin? So we have yes. this idea that we have free will, but when I understood you right, and cor correct me again if that's wrong, but the idea of free will is already an illusion. It's always been. So yes. machines just add another layer of this illusion. Yes, I think that's correct. Okay. Uh, and, and I would also Finally, say that, that, the idea that, that the, the idea that the idea that machines are an alien that is coming to, uh, you know, to, do, to do battle with us, it just, I, I think, yes. doesn't, doesn't make any sense. That doesn't, that's not really how it looks on the ground. You know, that's, that's, uh, it's very different. I sometimes think, and I haven't fully made up my mind, I'm not smart enough for this, but I feel like this free will is illusion that we have is an illusion that helped us survive. Again, that's my argument. You might not join me in this survival Darwinian, Darwinian argument, but I felt we adopted this idea of free will because it's, it kind of gives us this illusion to get out of bed in the morning. It gives us the illusion to fight against odds that are terrible. So the best thing on, from a rational perspective should have been stay in the cave, never leave the cave, and die quickly because in a less painful <laughs> death instead of battling with the animals and trying to survive. But it's right, and our ancestors gave us yeah. mm -hmm. this emotional induced nonsensical view of good odds. We call it free will, but the odds are terrible against us. But here's the here's the weird part: we they made it happen, right? So it, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. At least up to our generation, it might not last forever. It worked. Um, I have a different view of free will. Um, it's it's based partly on um, on the on the theories of um, uh, of a of a psychologist um, at at Princeton University, um, whose uh, whose name I'm I'm actually blanking on at the moment, um, but I can I can find it quickly. I think it's yeah. Hang on, I'll I'll, I'll find it in a moment. Yeah, no problem. Um, Let's see. Uh, ah, Michael Graziano. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm a I'm a fan of Michael Graziano's views on this. Um, his his perspective is that um, consciousness is really um, about having a model, and and originally it's a social model. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, we touched earlier on this question of of uh, you know what it means to make up a story about why you behave in a certain way. Um, yeah. We have social models of others, you know, for very important reasons. I mean, if you're a caveman and you know you and you have an injured knee, and, and there's another you know caveman coming at you and is looking at your injured knee, like you really want to understand what's going on in his head. That might really matter for your survival, right? You're you're you're, you're thinking about his about you're, you're you're developing a theory of mind. Now, theory of mind um, is. Uh, you know, which is, which is, by the way, not only important for, I mean, it's, it's important in a predator-prey relationship, both from the point of view of the predator and from the point of view of the prey, but it's also important for, for social hierarchies and for mating and for every other kind of interaction, right? Theory of mind is always like a superpower. Yeah. But the thing, the thing about theory of mind is you are never, your model is never complete. Um, you know, you're, you're never able to simulate in your head, you know, what every neuron, right, in, in my head is, sure. is doing. So it's always going to be a simplification. And, uh, and that means that there will be a gap. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I have to move to plug in. Um, there will always be a gap between the, um, between the simplification and the reality. And you have a lot vested in the idea of making that gap count. Because the moment you can be predicted perfectly, then um, you're in trouble. Uh, you know, if you can be predicted perfectly by your lover, you're no longer appealing. If you can be predicted perfectly by your predator, you will be caught. If you can be predicted perfectly by your prey, you won't eat, <laughs> right? So we, ha we have a lot vested in the idea of keeping a kind of inflated area, you know, right? Or, or yeah. keeping ourselves kind of on a, on a bit of a random cusp or, you know, having that liberty, right? That's, that's yeah. where our, our quest for Makes sense. comes from. Sure. So if, if that started socially, then um, it would, it's, only, it's, it's kind of obvious that you will apply that to yourself as well. 
uh, you'll develop a theory of your own mind too. You know, Torsten will have ideas about what Torsten will do in the future, you know, how he would react to this situation or that situation. So mm-hmm. I, I think that self-consciousness, you know, is actually a side effect, you know, as, as, as does, um, uh, you know, as does, as does Michael Graziano at Princeton, a side effect of social consciousness. And, yeah. um, uh, and, so it's and a bit of a randomness, is, uh, like a mutation randomness, right? Kind of. So it's, 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 a, it's a just an abstract randomness that we put in our personal forecast. That's right. That's right. And, okay. and we, can, we, can, we, we can do it through a combination of techniques, you know, through keeping ourselves close to the cusps of, of dynamical, of sort of saddle points in dynamical systems, you know, where you could go either way, right? Not, com- not committing too early. Uh, you can do it yeah. through actual random variables. You can also do it through, um, uh, through the through the use of memory, uh, you know this is why, like when you write, uh, you know, if, I mean, any, anybody who has ever you know written, uh, you know, uh, any, any kind of extended thing, right? You, you know that you you have always avoid using the same word twice, you know, in, two, in, in you know too close to each other, right? You don't want, you want to avoid predictability, right, in every interaction. Yeah. So I think that's what free will is, <laughs> uh, and I think and I think it's it good. applies I love in that. that sense for you know across species and across everything. Yeah, I love that. I think it's a it's a really well thought out. Um, one thing that I that plays into this, and I've been thinking about, is you know, if abstract thinking is kind of the uh, a part of free will, we call it that way. So, uh, but it's also kind of assimilating our actions. So instead of killing the animal, we can just think about killing the animal, play it through, and we don't die in nine of out of ten instances. We Absolutely. only die once yeah. we found an action plan that works, and we can yes. kind of stretch the time horizon and compress it. Yes. So abstract thinking. Yeah, simu- is simulation. Kind of this, this... I, I agree with you. Abstract thinking and simulation are both really important. Yeah. Will machines? That's a question. Is will they help us simulate better? And I think the question is ninety nine percent yes. But yes. B. Will they also run their own simulations? Well, from it, their own it depends. That depends on whether they're in social interaction with us. So um, right. you know the, what what makes these language model uh, you know kind of uh, AIs so interesting is that we're starting to train. AIs that are actually explicitly designed to be in social interaction with us. And I think yeah. that that's, that's why we start to have these questions about, you know, whether they have any will or they have any consciousness or we begin to empathize with them, you know, because in a way, this whole question of whether something, you know, whether there's anybody home is really just a question of empathy, uh, you know, empathy with others, empathy with ourselves. Um, and, uh, and so can a machine be trained to have empathy um, uh, yes, uh, I think so, and and I think that I think that in some sense the way you get there is by by um, by starting to develop machines that that inter- that are they're expressly designed to interact with us socially, as opposed to just performing uh, you know uh, asocial tasks. That's interesting. So you say empathy is a precursor or a core definition block of consciousness. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think so. In the sense that I think consciousness is effectively empathy with yourself, or mod, you know, modeling of. of well, yourself, I got to think right? about this. I never heard that. Empathy is. Oh, you said. Sorry, you said what? Well, I, I think I think the, the the boundary between empathy and um, and and social modeling or consciousness is a little bit of a fuzzy one. I mean, with empathy, we generally mean not just that you have a theory of mind or that you can model an, an other, but also mm-hmm. that you feel their pain, right? That you that you that you have a vested interest. In in in, yeah. in avoiding pain for them and 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 things being good for them, um, and that's that's a that's a social instinct, um, you know that that often goes along with having having social interactions. But of course, not always. If it's a predator prey relationship, then you know you 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 have theory of mind about your prey, but you're not going to feel its pain, right? You 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 dissociate those two things. So it's really about about the you know about what works for the system as a whole. Yeah. That's really deep. I got to think about that. Um, I, I, I don't know how to respond. <laughs> let's, let's go to some quick questions and sure. change the topic a little bit. Maybe we can return to it once I have some ideas on it. Um, what do you think of Apple Maps? Uh, um, well, I haven't, I haven't um, you know, done any kind of real comparison uh, between the, you know, the kind of remaining map platforms uh, you know, in, in, in a few years. So my opinions are going to be way out of date. Um, I mean, I, I, um, I use Google Maps. I still, find them, I still find them better, at least the last time that I, that I tried. But I know that Apple has made some, you know, some, some pretty big investments in it. Um, and I know that they're not nearly as bad as they were when they shipped. So, uh, you know, it's, I, think they, I think they've been having a, an impressive go at it. I don't know where they are at this point. It's very nice of you to say. Um... 
What's the best part of being in a kibbutz, according to your parents? <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, we haven't we haven't talked very much about uh, about the kibbutz where they uh, where they met or what that was like. I mean, I think they were both, um, you know, young and idealistic at the time. And uh, um, you know, my my sense is that they um, they they liked they liked the lifestyle for that you know for that time in their lives and for that period. Of course, a lot of the more hardcore beliefs of kibbutzim, you know, the collective child rearing and so on, you know, have been, I mean, you talked earlier about, about sort of the failures of communism. Uh, you know, I, I think some of those failures also apply to some of those more radical social theories of kibbutzim that, you know, just have not sort of withstood the test of time. What, I have two quotes for you. You probably know who it is, but um, maybe already on the first one, but maybe we, we need to do two. One is our inventions mirror our secret wishes. And mm. the second one would be travel can be one of the most rewarding forms of introspection. Mm. I like them you both know, a lot. Who the author is? No, who is it? Um, maybe it becomes clearer when you when we talk about your favorite Greek island. Oh, um, oof. Um, what is my favorite Greek island? Is it Corfu? I would say Corfu. Yes, <laughs> yes. Is that correct? You, you tell me. Well, uh, my, my I, I have I have really kind of a fantasy of Corfu. I mean, the, the reality is that the, the Greek island that I that, that that I've you know spent real time on is, is Crete, um, which which I uh, which I love. No, I mean I have a I have a fantasy of, of of spending sort of extended time on one of the smaller Greek islands and you know spending some time just you know writing and thinking there. But uh, it's 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 to be honest, not an opportunity that I really have had yet in life. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you, you at, at, at one of your prior appearances, uh, I think mentioned Lawrence Durrell as one mm -hmm. of your inspirations. And so those are, those are both, those are both Durrell, those are both Durrell quotes, I take it. Yeah, they are. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, indeed. Um, what is your favorite espresso origin region? Oh, <laughs> um, my, um, my favorite, my favorite origin is probably, um, Cafe Vivace's Vita blend, which actually comes from a, uh, it comes from a number of different. So I, I don't, I don't usually drink single origin espressos. Um, I, I guess okay. is, the, is the answer. Um, I, I like, you know, I like coffee shops that that you know that, that are serious about their sourcing and that and that blend blend the right things together. I like a fair amount of robusta in it because with a you know tiny bit of of milk to make a to make a um, you know a macchiato or a cortado, you know, like the the robusta is important to the way it blends. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you been to, <laughs> are you traveling? I know you're into coffee. That's what I assumed. Have you been to some of the origin regions, say Panama or Ethiopia or the no, Eastern Africa? Sadly, I haven't. Uh, that's, that's another, that's another thing to do in the future. But no, I, I, I mean, I'm into okay. coffee in the, in the way that, in the way that a, uh, um, you know, that an obnoxious Seattleite is not, not in a serious way where, wherein I've, I've actually, I've actually done the, uh, you know, the estate tours and things like this. What's your favorite piece of art that was drawn by a machine, produced by a machine? Uh, oh, that's a that's a hard one. Um, um, well, um, I guess I I um I really liked some of Memo Acton's um, work uh, from uh, from a few years ago. Um, I, I also, I also was very, was very fond of, um, uh, oh, there's, there's, there's an artist who did sort of er, very early, um, let's see, what was his name? Um, Harold Cohen, uh, Harold Cohen's computer art, uh, was very beautiful. And he was a really, he was a really early, uh, he, he died in 2016. Uh, so was an early proponent of this kind of stuff and, and, and did some beautiful work. Uh, some of it is a little bit reminiscent of, of Hockney's, Kind of iPad art, uh, so Hockney didn't use algor you know, algorithms. He did it you know, with his with his fingers, but but he really mastered you know just like iPad finger paint kind of thing as a, as a medium and, and did some very beautiful work. Um, you know, quite recently, I think in like 2014 or, or 2013. Um, and and um, and I see I see Bloom as being the um, uh, uh, or rather sorry Harold Cohen as being as being a little bit the uh, the kind of AI version of that. Uh, so it's very old school. So it's generated by an AI that he trains, 
Well, how does the interaction? I work? mean, it, it was it was it was very old school AI. So this is you know this is before the uh, you know before before they were trained. You know, it was it was uh, kind of blackboard systems and you know kind of more classical AI systems. Um, yeah. I mean, if we broaden if we broaden the question uh, a little bit, um, you know, my favorite AI art, I suppose, um, is uh, is 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 musical. Uh, it's um, it's the music of um, um, of of Cope. Uh, so let's see. Uh, let me let me let me try and let me try and find my my favorite. Um, it seems to be from the outside. Emily, Emily, Emily yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Emily, Emily Howells uh, from Darkness mm -hmm. Light. Uh, from Darkness Light. Um, this is uh, this is David Cope, who is also you know he's he's getting on in years, but he was the uh, I think I think the most the most brilliant uh, sort of computer assisted composer. He used uh, sort of natural language type techniques, uh, you know, to, to, and he started doing this kind of work in the nineteen seventies. And Emily Howell is the name of his AI partner. Um, and uh, from Darkness Light is uh, is a, a piano piece, a piece for two pianos, that I think is absolutely stunning. Um, and it's 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 quite recent uh, as as well. This this is um, you know it's it's just a few years old, but I, I think is I think or it looks like twenty ten actually. Now that I'm looking it up, but uh, yeah, absolutely stunning. From the outside, just spending a little more time on it, it seems like art is absolutely ripe for AI um, disruption. There seems to be an amazing amount of samples, right? There's a lot of data. Um, it's maybe hard to validate things, but it is we can use the data, we can train models, and we don't care necessarily what really goes on into an artist's mind. We care about the end result. So it looks like AI is going to be 99% mm -hmm. of the art in the next 10 years. Would you agree? <laughs> no. Um, I think that, I think that um, art is, you know, I mean, I, we come back once again to the question of, you know, what is, what is good art and, and, uh, and what's the function of art? You know, if, if we could measure the quality of a piece of art as a scalar, and um, and supply a bunch of examples and and then you know and then just like have it produce. Then I would say the answer to your question is yes. But you know, but actually David Cope's work is is you know I believe a wonderful illustration of why that's not really the case. Um, so Cope, I mean, he used he used traditional techniques, so it didn't rely on massive training data sets. You know, it was more it was more kind of you know old school NLP. Um, but you know, he, he began producing um, works you know, in the style of Bach, for example, or, or other classical composers that were really gorgeous um, and uh, you know, completely compelling and, and ran into a lot of resistance from the, um, from the, sort of, from the music, you know, from, the, from the composer community. And um, you know, many of them thought that he was bullshitting and, and that he was actually composing these things himself and it wasn't really done by a computer. So, you know, he kind of kept on upping the ante, and, and, and at some point he put out a zip file onto his website of 5,000 cantatas in the style of Bach, you know, just to prove, you know, that like in, in a whole lifetime he couldn't compose, you know, this many cantatas himself. I heard you know, and, about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, they're, and they're, they're largely, you know, pretty decent, <laughs> you know, right? I, I think that, you know, with a little more work, you know, we, we could easily generate, uh, you know, make an AI that, I mean, that this, this could be done with today's technology, no problem, that could generate thousands of cantatas that by any, you know, objective measure, right? By somebody who does not know all of the Bach cantatas would pass the Turing test or even be more beautiful than the ones that Bach made. But I don't think anybody would care. And, and, and that, that seems to be the case with, with, uh, with, with a lot of Cope's work as well. I've actually bought all of his CDs. They're, they're, you can buy them on Amazon. They're, they're like, you know, um, they'll, they're kind of print on demand, you know? And, um, and I, I have a feeling that I'm the only one, the only, the only person who has bought some of those CDs. Um, I have a whole shelf of them. So maybe that's you know, what's wrong with art these perhaps, days. And perhaps. I mean, I it's would, an interesting question, like right? But, <laughs> unsupervised learning is just going to go crazy with this stuff because we have this huge mm -hmm. data set, so much art produced, and then you look at Spotify, there's a perfect list of what's popular, say the first 2,000 or whatever, whatever ranking you want to use, and you just make more of it. That seems to be so ripe for machine learning, but it hasn't happened. So seemingly either it doesn't work, as you say, there's more to it, and we, we just don't know it consciously, or, or maybe it's hard, too hard to pull off, which I don't think. Like I don't think it's. I don't think that it's too hard to pull off. I think that I think that art is just not that reducible to something that is, you know, good or bad within the bounds of its own. You know, this. I mean, what you say about like it's just an output. It doesn't matter what was in the artist's head. I, I just. I, I'm not sure I buy that. I think that we do care, 
uh, and I think that I think that it's it's social function. It's not just about beauty. Um, you know, beauty was in some sense already um, has already been democratized by you know the amazing cameras that we now have. You know, in all of our iPhones and things like why you know why would it be the case that we would still care about about the photography you know of the great photographers of the past or even about great photographers period when everybody can make you know professional looking uh, photos with their uh, but it don't tell you like I look at art I go to a museum and I can maybe infer what he thought the artist but most of the time I have no clue especially with more modern art um, yeah. especially you know in the 20th century. I have no idea, and the, you know, maybe that's the idea that I inferred and make my own model of it. But mm -hmm. the, the, there's a little, you know, little description that nobody ever reads. So for ninety nine percent of anyone who interacts with art, they don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they well, care, but um, they don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't, I don't know Torsten. I think this is a little bit of a mystery. But you know, it, we we sure. we have to ask ourselves, like, what is the what what is the purpose of art? You know, or what is its function socially? And I think I think the answer is complex, and I'm I'm not sure anybody has a really a really great answer. But the idea that it's just something that you know has value in some kind of capitalist sense, and that you know, and that can be measured objectively, and so we can just make an AI that'll produce that'll crank it out in infinite amounts. We've already we've already seen this proof. We've already seen this proof of that. You know, yeah. like there's something else going on. And I don't. If think you put it possible. that way, it sounds terrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, Exactly, and in that sense, I'm very glad, right? That that you know the fact that we now have AI that can totally do that kind of stuff. It has not actually broken, you know, what yeah. art is. <laughs> How impatient are you with technology? You mentioned that earlier. You were kind of sitting out there and waiting for AI to take off uh, quite some time ago. When you when you scale your own emotional involvement. Um, how impatient are you and how do you think will the will that change will there be a, a quite a speed up in in change so um i am not impatient at the moment with ai i think that it's making extraordinary progress at a, at a, you know at, at a clip that i <laughs> i almost would not want increased you know beyond what it is now i think it's already coming at a rate that is you know frankly straining our abilities to think through all of the important questions <laughs> you know as it comes so so I'm, you know, I mean, I get impatient with, you know, with some of the projects that I'm really excited about in my own team, you know, uh, of course, you know, like we all want that stuff to go as fast as possible. But the rate of progress in AI generally, I don't, I don't think is too slow, if, if anything, the opposite right now. Um, but uh, one place where I do get really impatient is with uh, space exploration. You know, I, I feel like, I feel like we, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I strongly disagree with all of the, uh, you know, um, ecological arguments, you know, that we, we should not be interested in space because, you know, because it, it's, it's some kind of false choice. You know, we have to be focused on Earth and Earth's problems. I mean, I absolutely think we have to be focused on Earth and Earth's problems, but I also think that if we had gotten further with space exploration, if we had continued, we would actually be in better shape uh, with respect to a bunch of Earth's problems. Um, and, uh, yeah. you know, it seems to me, it's, it's sad to me that that after the fall of the Soviet Union, which I, I think the decline and fall of the Soviet Union was in many ways the reasons why this, the space program, you know, in the two great superpowers, you know, stopped, stopped happening. And, uh, and I think that's a, it's sad that it took a Cold War to make that happen. And it's even sadder that, um, that we have not kept our foot on the gas there. So um, that's, that's my big disappointment with, with, with technology. If we would go to Mars, would we, what do you feel of terraforming the planet? So basically putting a lot of changes into the atmosphere to make it more livable for us. Do you, isn't that climate change and isn't that a bad idea? Um, well, this is something that, as you probably know, Kim Stanley Robinson wrote about in detail uh, in the yeah. Mars trilogy. And he talks about the, you know, that, that sort of debate between the reds and the greens, uh, you know, or, or there might have been uh, some other color involved as well. But, um, but you know, that, that political debate, essentially. Um, yeah. I think that, I think that um, we, are, we are life. I don't, see, I don't see us humans as being separate from other kinds of life, um, which has always been invasive in some sense. Uh, you know, um, I I um I don't know what the stat what the what the status is of of microorganisms on Mars. Uh, that would probably matter to my judgment. If Mars is in fact sterile, then I I can't 
I have trouble imagining, you know, um, strong ethical arguments against the terraformation of Mars. And I think it would be a, a, a wonderful enterprise, actually, in, in a lot of ways. And would teach us a lot about Earth and about how to, and about how to do better stewardship here. Um, yeah. If there is a, if there is a local ecology, even if a very simple one, then I then I think it's a, it's a much more fraught question. Um, you know, I, maybe that will be a real question on Europa, if not on Mars, for example. That seems entirely possible that there's some, you know, non-trivial ecology under the ice there, and that'll be a real test for us in some way. Would you want to be a test pilot for the first flights to Mars or Europa? I mean, it's always been a, a big fantasy of mine, of course. Yeah. Okay. I didn't expect that. Interesting. Um, so you, you, because the flying experience or because you're the pioneer, you're that, that, that pioneer out there in space all by yourself, what, what was drawing you to it? Um, I, I just um, have always been excited about the idea of, of, um, of expanding, expanding the human frontier in some way. I mean, that's, that's what motivates all of my work. Um, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm very mindful of, and it's not, it's not an ego trip, and, and neither is it just about more or growth. I mean, I, I think about it in terms of, you know, what is the human project and, and, and how, can I, how can I do something meaningful, you know, um, in, in the context of the human project. I do see space as, as, as fundamental to that sooner or later. Again, I, I, I love Kim Stanley Robinson's books because I think he makes that picture, you know, of what, what space means in the, in the context of the human project very, very clear in the Mars trilogy, as well as in 2312, which is one of my favorite books of all time. So you don't mind the risks, right? That, that would be what, what draws most people away from it. It would be pretty risky and you might have no way to return. Um, yeah, so uh, one yeah, thing that's is, true. you know, being a scientist and the other one is being a little crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I mean, I'm probably more risk averse than I was, you know, when I was younger. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that would be hard, of course. Um, and you know there are real. Th I mean, right, there are people I love. There are things that you know. I, I mean, what about what about my uh, my espresso? <laughs> you know, and so on. Exactly. Uh, so uh, so I, I, I'm certainly not saying that it would be an easy decision, but it's one that I would be very very tempted by if if, if magically I were to have it. Of course. I mean, okay. I, I think I think one would have to be. Um, yeah, one would have to be a very different person from the one I am to not be very strongly tempted by 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 such an offer if I was out. Going back to AI, it's probably my last question. What can AI learn from religion? Oof. Uh, um, is there a religious model that we can build in an AI? Like, is that something we can even model um, A and B? What good could it learn or what negative could it learn from it? Well, um, I, I, have, I have views on religion that are probably probably fairly um, unpopular. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I have we to, want to, I hear have to them, admit, we want to hear I have them, to admit, please. Torsten, you're a little bit, you're a little bit making me nervous about, about, uh, you know, airing my, um, my opinions about this. I, I will once again, choose, reiterate that, um, I will reiterate that these are, these are entirely my own opinions. Um, I, I think, I mean, well, let's, let's, do, let's look at both sides. I mean, on, on the one hand, I think that religion um, has produced uh, extraordinary artworks you know, all, all of the religious traditions have produced extraordinary, extraordinary uh, sort of cultural artifacts of all kinds. So we were talking about Bach cantatas earlier, but we could equally well, you know, look at, at you know, Tibetan uh, monasteries or, or, you know, like myriad other. Um, and, and also, you know, if, if, we look at, if we look at the attempts to eradicate religion, you know, Soviet style or, or um, uh, you know, or, or in the cultural evolution or, or what have you, you know, those, those also are evil and autocratic. Uh, you know, a, a, approaches. So I, you know, I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I think that, I think that religion is, is, uh, is, <laughs> I would be, I would be very strongly opposed to any, any attempt to discriminate or eradicate uh, or anything of that sort. However, I also think that religion is, um, is, is almost a virus, uh, you know, is, is, a, is something that, that um, it, it's a power structure that is self-propagating. Um, it's sort of a hitchhiker along with uh, the, the mechanisms that give us cultural evolution. So, you know, our ability to learn from and have faith in, you know, the teachings of our ancestors and carry them forward and, 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 and evolve them. You know, I mean, that's what makes us human. It's very, very fundamental. But I think those same impulses are the ones that allow the power structures of religion to, to propagate. Um, 
you know, again, it's, it's probably served positive functions other than, um, uh, than just, you know, cultural artifacts. I think that, you know, in the Iron Age, um, you know, there were certain moral revolutions that religion uh, empowered. Um, but at the same time, it's, 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 a, it's a power structure. It's rigid. Uh, you know, those, it's, it's also resulted in, in, in enormous evils and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and the abuse of, of power. So yeah, I'm uh, yeah I'm not religious as as you might as you might imagine from what I just said. Yes, yeah. Um, and and um, I am not thrilled uh, about the idea of of uh, you know AI quote unquote learning from religion in the sense that I, I think that what that really looks like is is you know uh, you know an exercise in 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 how to do manipulation or how to do the propagation of power structures, um, which strikes me as as a weird game to play with. Um, uh, with, a, with a technical system. Uh, you know, I mean, an analog to that maybe would be the Scientologists, right, who, who sort of played with, you know, integrating technical systems together with religion uh, in, in order to, re to reinforce it. And, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think to very problematic effect. Yeah, I think there is, I, 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 I know where you're coming from, and I think this is a well-deserved critique um, for mostly religious institutions in my mind. You probably take mm -hmm. it further. Um, but religion that was lived and, and, and built over 2000 years in the Catholic Church. Um, there's a lot of things that have nothing to do with the original Old Testament because it doesn't even reference the Old Testament much. It's a New sure. Testament. It's, a, it's more power than thinking in my mind. There's, but obviously there's, there's a very fine line to walk. And uh, I, I, am, I, am been, a great, I am a great admirer of the new Pope. Uh, you know, I, I, think that, I think that he you know, has, has used um, you know, the, use the power of the institution in ways that advance certain things, uh, you know, in very useful directions. Um, I really liked his encyclical on, on the environment. Uh, you know, I thought that was fantastic and was also a very good use of the power that he's been invested with. So, you know, I, I, you know, I, I certainly I wouldn't want to be cartooned as saying, like, you know, religion is evil or something so simple as that. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a complicated topic. What yeah. I'm trying, and I think this is a very similar uh, topic, that's why I wanted to raise this. If we make this assumption, and you might you might completely argue against this, but let's just run with it for a second. You'd mm -hmm. say that religion and codifies a behavior that is good for the individual, but also good for society. Kind of like Adam Smith, but it's not. It needs some more abstract rules, right? The society feels it needs to error correct certain things, and that's what religion is for. It error corrects on a civilization or or on a society level for things where individual behavior properly incentivized by our emotions or properly incentivized by social behavior isn't good enough. So it gives you like this, this big view on error correction. Maybe, but I mean, you're, you're, you're using a teleological argument. You're saying like, because it exists, it must be solving, solving for something. And that may be true, but I, I think, you know, I mean, you could say that, I mean, what Let's about just assume mosquitoes? It. I just want to mosquitoes assume mosquitoes that. Also I, exist. To, I, <laughs> I, I, I probably, I won't, it won't convince you that that's my opinion, but that's, let's just assume this for a second, okay? Sure. So we will let, if you run with this, what happens if we say, well, the problem is these, these error corrections are really difficult. So they're very difficult to break down and when we apply them and when not. It's a complicated system. And think about 3,000 years ago, people didn't know how to read and write. It was very basic education only. So basically only what you can download from your immediate neighbors. There was no abstract knowledge to download anywhere because literally there were no downloads. Mm -hmm. And you needed to codify it into, into more abstract rules. So narratives, it came up with, with something that would, would people find interesting enough to orally transmit because otherwise mm -hmm. it would have died out because there was no way to put it down. So let's assume for a moment that's what it okay. does. Okay. But nobody knows how this actually works or how these rules are. So the knowledge of the creators of these rules, they might be so old that you can't, you can't error correct, right? They, they, they might be 5,000 years ago. So you can't talk to them. There's no way to say, oh, why did you institute this rule? And this resembles AI to me quite a bit. It comes up with, we talked about explainability earlier. It makes up these rules, but we can't just error check and say, oh, why did you come up with this rule? Why did you say mm -hmm. this is a good rule? Um, mm -hmm. But with the religion kind of solved it, right? It, 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 it went through this knot and said, especially the New Testament said, well, just believe in me and be, you're going to be fine, right? It, 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 just try it out. And if it doesn't work for you, just drop it. Maybe that's something that AI has the exact same problem. Maybe the explainability doesn't need to be there as long as it works. Let's go back to the utility function. Hmm. 
I mean, what you're saying reminds me uh, a little bit of a, a theory that I, I really like. I think I'm, I'm trying to remember where I read this. I feel like it was probably in Joseph Henrik's book, The Secret of Our Success, which is about social I love, I love how you remember the sources. I often don't remember the sources. Maybe I have it from somewhere else, too. I try, I try but... but um, no, you're great. You're great. But you're he, very, very well. What, what, what Henrik um, claimed, and I don't, I don't know what's... I, 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 I actually do need to go and look up the primary source for this, but but it was about um, divination, uh, about uh, which is you know a, a sort of simple you know I mean well I shouldn't say simple it's it's a hunter uh, a, a feature in many hunter gatherer religions, um, you know whether the divination comes from you know entrails or from the flights of flocks of birds or other kinds of phenomena like this, but but um, it's something that has arisen independently in many many um, uh, indigenous societies. And um, it's used in some very typical ways, uh, you know, for, for directing where you go to hunt or where you plant and when. And, um, and the, uh, the, the, the thesis is that, you know, really what these are are actually the random number generators, you know, like uh, the, the entrails or the flock of birds or whatever. And, and the places where they, they're adaptive, where they're useful, are the places where... Um, where picking a random uh, a random number is better than using your rational thinking. So, for example, if you're hunting, okay. you know, then absent divination, you will go to the same place that you shot the deer last time. You know, like so, you know, you'll 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 you'll, reinf- you'll try to reinforce, you know, uh, build on on prior success. But the reality is that if you go back to the same spot, then your odds will be worse than uh, than random because you know the animals will be avoiding where you where you were so you know basically in, in yeah, any place that that an optimal algorithm or a more optimal algorithm is random uh you know versus uh, uh you know versus uh, reasoned right or principled uh you know divination will win uh and the, the funny thing though about that is that divination in order to work requires that you believe in it you know, like mm-hmm. if you if you learn from your grandfather, you know that like you you have to cut the entrails in a certain way, and 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 if they fall this way, you go that way. You know, never you know, f- ignore your your rational brain. Like do what the entrails say. It's only the ones who believe it, who yeah. will you know outcompete right? the uh, you know the the ones who are too clever for their own good, right? Um, yeah. So you know, I think that's a version in a way of 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 uh, you know a simple version of what of what you're talking about. Um, but I, I mean, I, that's I, I feel like I feel like if, if we're playing games with AIs in which they're trying to come up with stories that work on our credulousness, uh, you know, that right, that create myths, uh, you yeah. know, because they serve some some kind of utility like that. I I feel like I feel like that's just a very a very um, it's a dangerous place to go. Uh, I would rather that we, you know, actually understand when ra- when random algorithms are the right thing, and you know, and, and then know. You know how to how to actually optimize that, or maybe there's a maybe there's an even better than random algorithm that would you know that would do the trick even even better. But you can only get to that when you actually understand the principles underneath. You know, so the religion you know it tends to be about about sort of replacing uh, you know uh, systematic thinking with uh, with with some some article of faith, and that can be better than not having the article of faith. But better still, I think, is is actually being able to you know to kind of see all the way through it. If that if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to look at this. I think I, I I like that idea of the random number generator. But the better way to look at it would that be would that be math or physics? Um, yeah, or 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 modeling. I mean, this is where we get to the you know explainability problem. I mean, if you if you have an, a neural net that can um, that can model a function really really well, uh, you know, for some definition of good modeling, yeah. then it may not be particularly reducible further, it, you know. So, in that, in some sense, it may it may fail the explainability test, you know, to really to really kind of go much further with it. But you still have a model. You know what its inputs and outputs are, and you know in what sense it's optimal, in what sense it's a good model. And um, yeah. I think, for in, in many cases, that 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 will have to be enough. I mean, take the take the 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 cancer example. You know, if you don't understand anything about why certain cancer diagnoses are happening, then that, that may be a problem because it may be doing something bogus, right? Like reading, like reading the text on the on the on the edge of the X-ray, you know, and, and making some inference based on your neighborhood, or, or you know, right, doing something that that you don't get. But but at some level, if you if you're sure that it really is just looking at, say, the structure of some cells or some tissues, 
and um, you know, and, and making a judgment that is kind of ineffable, that is the sort of judgment that a skilled expert, you know, can make, but the machine can make it even better, then, you know, I, I don't know what it means to explain it any more than that. It's just, okay, we've got, we've got a really good judgment that we've made. You know, we understand well enough that it's not, it's that, that we, we kind of know what goes in and what comes out and, and approximately why, but further explanation is not, is not necessarily uh, in, in, in the offing. You know, we're kind of at the limits of language. Yeah. That's going to be an interesting future. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because we, we got to look at a lot of things that are going to look like magic to us. And um, let's see yeah. how we deal with this. That's yeah. going to be a big social experiment. Um, and I we feel it's already the case. When I, when I look are, at some AIs these yeah. days, it, it looks like magic. Sure. I mean, I can read about it and then it becomes less like magic, but it still feels like that. We are, we are totally in that social experiment now. I mean, we talked earlier about, about super intelligences already being here, Torsten, like the stock market, you know, is an example of, of one such. I mean, you said things about like economists think all the information is out there and so on. I, I mean, maybe, although there are also all kinds of high frequency trading bots, you know, you know, manipulating the markets in various ways that we don't understand. And, you know, how can you really explain, you know, why the stock price, you know, of a company rises or drops in a given day? I mean, it, it is beyond explanation already. You know, we're already in that in that in that kind of universe that we're talking about now, and in a, in a way that's consequential, right? I mean, money is consequential, so I, I feel like we're already there. Well, on that magic note, guys, <laughs> thanks for taking the time. That was fantastic. I, I learned so much, and you definitely boggled my mind. Oh, thank you, Torsten. That's really um, that was was incredible. That's really thanks kind. It was a great this. great conversation. You brought into mind as well, and uh, um, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely, and I hope we get to do this again. Likewise. Thanks again, Blaze. Cheers. Bye.